Welcome to the Clemson Dubcast, Friday, October 15th, hours away from Clemson's game at Syracuse tonight. All sorts of coverage and analysis ongoing through today into kickoff, and of course, all sorts of analysis and coverage exiting the game into tomorrow and the weekend, and of course, continued excellent recruiting coverage from our guy Paul Strelo, TigerIllustrate.com. My good friends Blake Smith and Brooke Archenhold have been part of the podcast since the beginning, way back in August of 2018. They have an accomplished team of personal injury attorneys at Parm Smith and Archenhold based in Greenville. They are Clemson people, and their skillful attorneys have decades of experience in complicated litigation matters, taking a special interest in medical malpractice, nursing home abuse and neglect, car accident cases that have left the individuals involved in serious trouble. For a free consultation at Parm Smith and Archenhold, call 864-990. 4581 or online at parhamlaw.com. That's P A R H A M law.com. Football season is grilling season, and Jack Oliver's Pool Spa and Patio is South Carolina's premier source for the big three Weber, Traeger, and Big Green Egg Grills. Blackstone Griddles, too. I'm Jack Oliver. Grill all your tailgate favorites to perfection with a premium gas, charcoal, or pellet grill, then top it all off with something sizzling from your Blackstone Griddle. For grills, griddles, patio furniture, hot tubs, and saunas, shop in store or online at Jack Oliver's Pool Spa and Patio, Forest Drive in Columbia, and jackoliverpools.com. If you're in the Eastern Midlands and PD area and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home, commercial property, land, need to consider reaching out to Uptown Realty. They're based out of Sumter and run by a friend of mine, Patrick Enzer, big Clemson guy, used to cover the Tigers in a newspaper capacity, longtime supporter of Tiger Illustrated, longtime listener to the Dubcast. The home buying process should be an enjoyable experience, so let Patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803-774-0435 or go to UptownRealtySC.com. Okay, to our conversation with T.O. Terrence Oglesby, who is moving up in the media world. Always fun to check in with Terrence. One of the hardest working guys out there for sure. And on top of that, his ability to analyze the game of basketball second to none. Fun conversation here. Here we go. All right, joined by Terrence Oglesby. How you doing, man? I'm hanging in. I'm, uh, I am actually have a day or two off which i haven't had here in the past month and a half two months i've stayed pretty busy leading up to the season and and uh you know outside of doing some of those previews that a lot of you know, clemson people know about I, i've been able to pick up on a couple of new ventures so it's been exciting it's been busy and uh now that i got a day off i got to see you play the drums so that fires <laughs> yeah. me up a little bit well i was sitting there so i'm playing music <laughs> at patrick square on tuesday evening and i see you walking around with your kids and i'm like wait a minute i was just texting with him yesterday or maybe talking to you or maybe texting i forgot and you were saying you were going to ac the acc media tip-off function on tuesday and i'm like so he's already back and he's being family man which is i was really impressed i i can play drums and still be impressed at your at your uh schedule and and devotion to family at the same time that shows how coordinated i am i guess well, I try, <laughs> I try my best because, you know, there was a period of time when I was growing up, Larry, I, I would say, you know, about third or fourth grade through middle school, my dad wasn't around a whole lot because he was working so hard. And, and it's, you never know when I might get an opportunity where I might have to miss some of these things. And, um, you know, media day is media day. You've been to them. You're not really going to get any great answers out of anybody. It's all coach speak. You're going to get all your information probably sitting down eating lunch. But it's uh, I, I I actually bolted out of the, out of media day at about two o'clock after the last uh, set of teams finished. Uh, said bye to Debbie Antonelli and then uh, took off because my daughter had a soccer game at five. So I drove back from Charlotte probably a little too fast. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, made it back for her soccer game. And then after that, uh, my wife was really excited about Patrick Square and the band and you guys. And, <laughs> and uh, whenever we got back, uh, my daughter was wanting to dance. And then here I was uh, playing along and dancing a little bit. But the, the, the restaurants, poor guys over at Joe's Pizza or, or that place over there, Patrick Square, they don't have enough people to work, uh, which I think is a – I think that's a reoccurring theme. Uh, yeah. Not only – Clemson, but pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I was trying to get your attention while I was playing because I saw you and your kids dancing, and then 
I didn't think I successfully got your attention, and then I sent you a text that night. I said, "Hey, man, I I don't know if you noticed, but I was I was playing the drums. <laughs> I I was trying to get your attention, but I, I wasn't able to do it. And then you're like." Oh no! I saw you, and then you sent me a oh, video yeah. of me playing from behind the stage. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm always alert, baby. You don't have to worry. No, I saw you. I know. I know that you're busy and all that stuff. And I tried to wave at you from the side, but man, you were you were locked in. You were in your uh, you were in your flow state. I wasn't about to mess that up. So, no, your band was great. My daughter loved it. It seemed like seemed like everybody loved it, man. So, congratulations on a heck of a gig. It was uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I'm so happy that we moved back to Clemson because we're able to do some things like that. Well, you know, the, I, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I interrupted. Yeah, I didn't I you know, we moved around a lot when I was little. And uh the fact that uh, we're able to attend things like that and I have time to or I don't necessarily have time, but I make time to attend those things. Uh I think it's something that my kids are going to remember and that's important to me. Where can you specifically all the bouncing around you did as a kid? Uh, can you share some of that? Well, my dad was really successful, so uh, and he didn't really get to be really successful until I was maybe in high school. So we kind of saw the grind of you know I I went to four different elementary schools, two middle schools, and finally. Uh, you know, when I got to high school, my dad actually took a job for a year in the town that I went to high school. And then he was so convinced with the high school coach that I was playing for that I needed to stay that he actually worked in Atlanta. That's where his business was headquartered. And then he would drive back and forth to games. And then sometimes he would drive two hours the night before the game just to shoot with me and then drive back to Atlanta to work the next day and then drive back to my high school in order to uh, be able to go to the game. So, uh, you know, that, that stuff will always be important to me. And I want to, you know, treat my kids the same way that my mom and dad treated me and, and with the effort. Uh, more than anything, you don't appreciate the effort so much. It's just kind of a given when you're in that position. Like, of course, dad's going to be there, but you don't realize the kind of effort that it takes for you to get there. And uh, I, I just, I, like, I, I'm going to do my best for you know, to, just to be around and to be at some of these things. It's easier said than done because, of course, any good parent, you know, wants to be devoted to his or her children. But when you're, yeah. when you're, it's easy to say. Yeah, it's easy you, to say. You know, and then you're tired. You know, after that ACC media day, man, I was, I was a little, you know, I was a little grumpy because you, you know, I, I didn't feel like it was as much of. A, I had, I guess, I had an expectation for ACC Media Day that there was going to be a lot of basketball being talked about. There just wasn't, and so I was, I was a little bummed about that. I was uh, bummed about uh, some things that happened with ACC Network that didn't happen in my favor, but I think that ended up working out for the best. And then, uh, even then, you know, I woke up at you know four thirty to make sure I had everything that I was adequately prepared just in case I was asked questions and most and about eighty percent of the stuff I prepared for I did not get to ask about or was not even talked about but I was still able to make sure that I was ready just in case and you know man I was tired you know I grabbed a quick bite with a couple of producers for lunch but you know you're trying to talk between mouthfuls of salad and a little bit of steak and it's like you don't and then as soon as you get out of there you you have to bolt and get all your stuff and make sure everything's ready to go. And I was lucky, fortunate enough to be able to make her soccer game. And then you get to her soccer game and she doesn't even want to play. <laughs> so it's like, it's like, it's like uh, just a triple whammy, but it, it, it's worth it for me just to make the effort for her to see me when, I, when she's there. Is this at Nettles? Is she playing soccer there? Yeah. She plays soccer over at Nettles. Gotcha. And gotcha. She, she, you know, she's, she's in that, you know, three and four age groups. So of course she's not going to be overly interested, but you know, I'm pretty, I was pretty athletic. I'm not, I wasn't a 1% athlete. I would consider myself probably a two or 3% athlete, but like my wife was a really good athlete. So she's got it in her. It's just a matter of if she wants to do it or not, we're trying to figure out, you know, our kids are so young. We want them to do everything just so they can figure out what they like and whether it's dancing or whether it's soccer, I want to make sure that, uh, whatever they decide, I'm going to support them. So that, that's really important to me. And even though I'm tired sometimes, it, my being tired doesn't matter. So it's it's more important for them to see me there. Are you going to be the dad sort of moving 
forward long term who's watching the game sort of quietly um, and just sort of observing and then giving some insight afterward? Or are you going to be the dad who's more into it and uh, shouting, not shouting, but, 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 you know, giving encouragement or instruction to your kids while they're doing whatever sports they're doing? Have you, have you thought about that? Uh, I'll probably, my dad was quiet. My mom was nuts. So it, <laughs> it was like, it was, they couldn't sit together at high school games. So like, um, I, I could see myself be really encouraging and clapping and stuff like that when he's younger. And then as he progresses and gets older, I can see myself because Larry, like, let's just say my son wants to play basketball. If he does, if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. But if he does, uh, I have a lot to give him. Yeah. And so like a lot of the particulars, like it would not be best suited to tell him in the middle of a game. So for me to be able to like look and be like, Hey, maybe next time try this. You know, the most that I would ever give my kid during a game would be like, hold your fall through, which is all my dad ever gave me. And it was like, and, you know, it just, just kind of that reassurance that, you know, one, I'm going to be there. Two, like everything's going to be fine. And, and afterwards, then I can poke around and, you know, if he wants to, like I said, I, I could see myself being the quieter one. Well, so you said your mom was crazy. How crazy? <laughs> just emotional she almost yeah. got arrested <laughs> uh, <laughs> no we were playing in a, we were playing a game and cut, we were playing in the region tournament or something like this she didn't almost get arrested larry I'm, I'm, there's a little there's a bit of hyperbole there but, oh, but okay, she, gotcha. she uh we played a game against red bank in the region tournament we had the number one ranked team in the state we played against a, they were they were a crap team that year and we had Middle Tennessee officials come over and officiate our game, and I think the foul call was like thirty-five to six or something like that. We had five guys foul out, like it was a mess. And my mom was going to let these coaches, these referees, have it, and <laughs> she went over there to have a word, and the cop stopped her, ma'am, ma'am. And ever since then, I've always teased her a little bit that she, I got to keep her out of prison every time we play. But <laughs> no, she she's good. She's nothing but supportive. I mean, you want to talk about super supportive. My mom is just all in all the time, no matter, you know, what I want to do. Like, it's just uh, you want a confidence boost. My mom was my mom was awesome. But she was she was also interesting because then she would be like, hey, just so you let you just to let you know, just to let you know, if you lose, if you lose. I still love you. You know, when I was, when I was young, my mom, it, it used to drive me nuts. I'm like, I'm not going to lose mom. I'm not going to lose. What are we even talking about? We're not going to lose. And, and that along with obviously working hard and having confidence in my game, I think that helped me at the end of games. And I was always good at the end of games because I didn't care if I missed it. I mean, I cared. I wanted to win, but the thrill of winning so out outshined the fear of losing. Uh, I mean, did I say the fear? The, the joy of winning so outshined the fear of losing for me personally that I didn't. The risk reward was there for me tenfold. Does that make sense? Yeah. What about actually when you lose? Is it worse or is it? Do you hurt more when you lose than you experience joy when you win? Because a lot of people are like that. They they remember the losses. I'm not. I'm not like that. I'm no. the other way. Yeah. I'm the other way. <clears throat> it, it it's like I, the the win will keep me up at night. The loss to hell with it. Uh huh. I, I, at least I shot it. Yeah. Like we had a guy when I played at Clemson, and I'm not going to name names on this one, but this is how I felt. Like. He was great all game. He was he all game. He was money. He was somebody you could rely on. But if he had certain numbers towards a certain portion of that game, he was going to shut it down. And and at the end of the game, he was looking for somebody else to take that shot. I wasn't like that. I didn't care uh, if I was going to make it or if I was going to miss it. I really wanted to make it. I thought it was awesome to make it. If I missed it, it was like, well, I deserve to take it because I already won. I already I already worked on it. I deserve to take the shot, so I miss it. Who else you want to shoot it? And it, that's kind of how – it's kind of strange because I have my uncle 
who's the other way, and we do a lot of business ventures together, and he kind of guides me and everything. And, and he's like, he has to pull me back sometimes. Like, hold on now, Terrence, can't can't just throw, just can't do that. <laughs> not everything's a home run. Not everything's apple. And I'm like, why not? And you know, that's kind of uh, it's it's a. I think it's a blessing of mine, but it's all, it, it could also be a curse without the right guidance. What uh, what kind of business venture business ventures are you in? If you don't, if if, if that's not private, I would prefer to, I would prefer to keep a lot of it out. But, sure. Uh, you know, I, we I do some real estate. Uh, I do. I, I've built and sold about five or six homes in the Brookhaven area, and then uh, I've, I've I've jumped in a little bit of the um, corporate real estate world. I'm not as big a fan of that, but you know, it's, it's all a learning process. And then there's the real estate part is still, uh, it's very intriguing to me. And that's something I kind of went off on my own and attacked a little bit. And I have a team that, uh, I really trust doing that. So, yeah, I can't remember the last time we had you on the podcast. I want to say it was off the air when you were, I was asking you further about sort of the playing overseas and some of the living conditions you and your wife were experiencing. And so I, I don't think that was on the air, but I just want to maybe rehash that because I, that's one of the one of the most interesting things I took from that conversation that we had both during what did and we talk, which one did we talk about? I've got so many stories, man. We were just like, talking about how to, how where y'all were living. It was like you know, it was it was some pretty pretty rough sort of conditions in the in the apartments and, and things like that when you were playing yeah. over there. Yeah, I mean, you know, for example, like I would take, like I took uh, the first three jobs I took, I took strictly on the advice of an agent. Um, after that, I kind of made sure to ask questions about the apartment beforehand. But even if I did, it wouldn't really matter because it was, because it would look one way in a picture and we'd get there. It would look <laughs> completely different. Uh, you know, we, we, we had an apartment in France um, that she, my 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 mom was in town, and the door only opened with a key. In, inside of the door, or outside the door, it only opened with a key. This building was built. I'm telling you, Larry, this building was built. I want to say in the 1800s at some point, and it had all this old stuff from the 30s and the 40s, and it was a pretty neat little place. But it had its idiosyncrasies, and one of the, the key being the major one. Well, my wife took off with my mom. And I had gotten on her. I was like, hey, baby, you need to have your phone just in case something happens. And she takes the key to leave and locks me inside. <laughs> and we're on the third floor. And I had to catch a ride to practice. <laughs> so we the problem was we had a game the next day. So I missed all the film study and everything like that. I was like, guys, I will jump out the window. Like, I'll do it. It just, you know, it, it, it's just a lot, a lot of those different things. It can be... Um, it can be challenging, you know. When my last year in Sweden, I signed with a with probably the bottom team in the in the division, and uh, because they gave me an open contract, and because they didn't know if I was going to stay for a long time, they put me in a student apartment. Well, student apartments basically just uh, a bathroom, a small stove, and it's a studio, and it's basically a dorm room with a small sink, and. Um, we had just had a baby. We showed up and my wife was like, what have you, what do you have me in right now? And we slept together on a single bed. And then our son, Damon, who was just born, he was, gosh, I want to say two, three months old. We, we had a, but they gave a, they, they got us a baby crib that we put in the corner and he would wake up, man, four o'clock in the morning because, you know, at that far North in Sweden, the sun won't go down all the way, especially during the summer. So he would wake up four o'clock in the morning. I'd have a game. He'd just be standing up looking straight at me and just start talking and jammering and everything. And, you know, there was no escape and it was just, you know, you do it because you love it, but it got to the point that year I was like, you know, cause I ripped my hamstring that year. And, uh, because I was about to sign with a team in Spain in December, uh, I ripped my hamstring a week before, uh, they were allowed to offer the contract over. And then after that, I was like, you know what? I can't do that to my wife anymore, especially now that we have kids. Like she's, she's been tough enough, whether it be living in Georgia with rats in the wall and 
she has to. Yeah, that's you know, what I was. That's what you mentioned. Yeah, with rats in the wall or, or going to France and not really having anything to do. And French people don't speak any other language than French, so it, it made you know it's difficult. It's lonely for. Her. And then now we have kids, and so we were kind of creeping on the way out. And then when Lucas McKay decided. It, whenever he gave me a call over at the office, then it finally gave me an out to be able to kind of advance on with my life. And then one thing leads to another, and now I'm doing this stuff. And Lucas, who was the director of basketball ops at the time for Clemson, yeah, he called you with what opportunity? It wasn't really an opportunity. He knew I was coming back to finish my degree because mm-hmm. I called, I called uh, Leslie Moreland, who is, a, I, I tell everybody this, but that's a sweetheart of a human. And I called her, I was like, hey, you know, I'd like to come back. I'd like to get my degree from Clemson because that's important to me. And she goes, well, they just put in this program uh, two years ago. What was it? What is it called, uh, Larry? I can't. I can't remember either. I'm like, I, it's, so it's not Paul Journey. It's uh, Tiger Trust. That's right. Yep. To where they were going to pay for my schooling. And whenever they said that, and then Lucas asked if I'd like to help out with the team this year, I jumped at it. And, and because it gave us some stability for two years and, uh, you know, it gave me the ability to learn about the other side, which gosh, has been unbelievably advantageous to what I'm doing now. Um, you never, so I'm, we'll get into this in a minute about what you're doing now, but I was listening to the podcast that, you guys had with uh, uh, guest uh, Randolph Childress, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking uh, you would be a good coach. <laughs> like, yeah. you, did you just decide that 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 wasn't for you, or that that it would take too long to sort of work your way up the ladder, or you're just, you're just not that type of guy, or what? Because I mean, the way you break yeah. down players yeah. and 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 X's and O's, I'm thinking this guy should be running a show somewhere. Yeah. You know, I've thought about it. I, I just, the, the, the take too long part is a big one. Um, you, you know, I, I'm not a very good errand boy, Larry. Yeah. I, I got a lot of ideas. Uh, you know, if they're not taken to heart, then I get pissed. And then like it, you know, even if you don't use them, just, you know, and that didn't happen at Clemson that happened at my next stop. And I, I worked for basically a friend as opposed to working where I thought would be the best fit. And, and this was where? Carson Newman. Okay, yep. And we didn't we didn't have a nice we it was a it was a bad dynamic because um there was a lot of that involved. And to be honest with you, whenever I do something I can't ball into it. So it's like I wouldn't leave I would leave in the morning really early, get home really late at night and I was missing a lot of my kids. Uh, development and whenever my dad passed and my brother is kind of a vagabond now he's living in Norway um, you know I'm the only male figure that's going to be in my kids lives a lot and it was very important for me to be able to do my work from home and to be able to be around more and it's funny. Everybody's like, well, I, some of the coaches that I talked to, well, I didn't, it's nice to be able to have a life. Well, that's true, but I don't, I'm not one of these guys that necessarily believes in work life balance. As long as you're in the proximity of your family while you're working. So like if I'm always going, but I'm still around, I think that's important because I think it's important for my kids to see that I'm working hard. But the fact that they couldn't see me working hard because I was somewhere else, it bothered me. And there were just a lot of things when my father passed away that, uh, you know, I wanted to be around for. If nothing else, just be around. And when was your father, when did he pass? August 11th, 2019. Was it unexpected? Completely. Oh, man. He he walked, gosh, I want to say nine and a half miles that morning. The dude looked like Zeus. I mean, he's six... He was 6'8", you know, 220 pounds, and, I mean, covered in muscle. It's just, um, you know, it was the hottest day of the year in Nashville that day. He did it outside, and 
he had an enlarged portion of his heart that was only enlarged that day because he had had a yearly physical every year for the past 20 years or something, and they had never picked up on it. And he was a big guy anyway, so, I mean, 6'8", you know, they could have missed it and just chalked it up to, well, he's 6'8". And uh, heart just stopped. I was I was taking my son swimming, and, um, you know, we were actually sending him a video of my son's first time jumping off a dive board, mm. and we got a phone call. And uh, we obviously bolted to Nashville as quick as we could. Yeah, that's where he was living at the time. And uh, you know, talk about your world shaking because you know I, he was somebody I talked to two, three times a day. And you know, it, it was it was hard for it was really difficult for me. And uh, you know, I, it it led me, it got me away from coaching a little bit and focused more on what's mine. And what I mean by that is what's mine as far as my family's concerned, because all these coaches and everything, I, I don't think I have the capacity that Dabo has wherever he's able to love some of these players like he loves his own family. I don't have that ability. I really liked my players. I really cared for them, how they felt and how they did in life. But if I had to pick between them and my kids, like it's not even close. And I think there's a lot of coaches out there, especially the super successful ones, that can't make that distinction. And whenever I had to choose, it was a very easy choice for me. So it took that, I mean, so that's really sort of what it took for you to, for it to crystallize in your mind was your losing your father. Uh, is, is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well that, and I, you know, I went to school to do this, to do broadcast journalism and things like that. I was a comm studies guy at, Clemson and I always enjoyed dealing with the media even back when I played besides the time on the lake whenever I turned one media <laughs> member down because he wanted to go on a wakeboard <laughs> but, but like other than that like I've always enjoyed being around the media and talking and talking hoops and all that stuff and and uh I whenever I got the opportunity to call a couple of games whenever Munson and Beret were uh, doing football and I did the Charleston classic. It was like, man, this is awesome. This is a lot of fun. I'm still part of the game and I'm not directly, my emotions aren't directly dictated by one team doing something right or wrong. It's the entire atmosphere of everything that's going on inside. And I thrive off of that. And then the good part for me, Larry is as soon as it's done, it's done. Like as soon as the game is finished, I can let go of it emotionally. Mm. And I, I couldn't do that when I was coaching either. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's that, that's what a lot of that comes down to. And the fact that I, lo- I love basketball and I can just talk about basketball and it doesn't have to be about one team, that's one of the, you know, blessings of doing this stuff with Field of 68 is, you know, I'm not just covering Clemson. I'm not just covering the ACC. I'm covering all Power Five and the Big East and Gonzaga for that matter. So, I mean, it's – um it's it, it, to me like I'm in heaven. I prepare. I can prepare. I over prepare, and then I can have an honest conversation about every team that I watch. And you can walk away from it, just like exactly you said. Right. He, uh, exactly right. He, uh, at least to walk away. At least walk away from it emotionally. Yeah, I mean, like, you're not emotionally invested in in what yeah. you're covering. Yeah, and and I'm always, like, my wife gets on me. Like, I'm always on my phone. I'm always, like, the next thing, like, I I understand all that. I understand, you know, I don't want to be a breaking news guy. Me and you have talked before about some things not Clemson-related to where it's like, man, you know, that that would be pretty good to be able to, like, put out there. But that's not where, that's not the direction I want to go. I'm going to leave that stuff up to Jeff Goodman, my friend Jeff Goodman, who I'm working working alongside. Like, that's not... Uh, my niche. I, I would prefer to go a little bit more in the direction of Herb Street as opposed to uh, what's what's the guy's name? Schefter. I'd rather yeah. be she- I'd rather be Herb Street than Schefter because I don't really care about a lot of that breaking news stuff. Somebody else can do it, then I'll analyze it after the truth comes out. Yeah, I love. I would love to shadow Herb Street for a week because I'm picturing what he does. And he works hard, obviously, but his work is on watching a lot of film all week, right? And talking to the coaches and players of the two teams that he's about to cover that weekend, yeah. and yes. um, delivering really, really good 
authoritative analysis on, on, on what he's covered instead of, and so you, when it's that he can, you know, he can bust his ass from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on a weekday when he's back home before he's off to whatever location, and then he can shut it down at 5 o'clock and do what you were doing, go to Patrick Square and <laughs> and, yeah. and, and be with his family versus, uh, yeah, the I, I don't, yeah, we did talk about this. Uh, Jeff Goodman, one of the best college basketball reporters mm-hmm. in, in, in the business, and Schefter and all that. I mean, those guys... I don't. I couldn't do that because you're never. No, I mean, you're never off. The bear a little bit. What's that? Yeah, they, they they don't turn it off. I mean, but you know, the fact that turning it off, I, like I said earlier, I'm not sure that's a big concern of mine. It's just um, when my kids need me there. So, for example, like when we got done at Patrick Square, we went home and ate. I went home and and did another podcast with I can't remember what school it was. So, like it's. It, like for me, like the work doesn't bother me. No, what I'm saying it's, is, what I'm saying is, turn the phone off. As far as like, um, so if you were Goodman uh, on Tuesday evening when you're hanging out with your family, dancing with your kids, and you get a text saying uh, such and such assistant is leaving for blah 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 blah, it's not. Oh, well, I can't do that. I can't. You know, I'm with my kids. It's up. Oh, sorry, kids. I got to work. I got to go. Right. I got to spend twenty minutes putting this out there making calls or whatever yeah whereas that that's the that's the biggest difference uh it, it seems yeah like. And, and and like goodman didn't play Schefter didn't play so you, you know that that was their way in and they they have those relationships to where people reach out directly to them for those things uh you know i probably do too but i i would just you know coaches aren't calling me with brand new news and i, I don't want it you know, I, I would rather, you know, if, if I get some information, I would pass it off to somebody else and then they can do the net, the due diligence before putting it out. I'm not going to be that guy because I, I, I think there's such a precedent right now on being first instead of being right. Yeah. And I think that's very unfair because then somebody puts something out and, you know, it could be really damaging and, and these guys have families and things like that. So if it's not right, you could put somebody's livelihood at, at risk. And that's not fair. And I, I, I don't think that's specific to sports either, Larry. I think you're in agreement. Mm-hmm. Sure, absolutely. All right, so the last time we had you on, it was late last basketball season. And uh-huh. and, and and let me know if I miss anything, but you were doing you were doing uh, some, some TV um, uh, analyst work for the ACC, ESPN ACC. You were doing radio, uh, some radio yeah. stuff for, for Clemson. Uh, men's and women's basketball. You were also putting out the uh, preseason preview, which you did all all yourself, a uh, little booklet uh, for the yep. ACC. Um, anything else you were doing at that time? Let's see. The book. I did a show every Thursday with Facts That's and right. Childress from a, from a from a studio in Greenville at Pronk Studios. And Faxon, who's I, I think sharp as a whip, he's a freshman over at Clemson. He was he was great, but um, I did that over there at Prague, and that was strictly just to get some time in front of a camera. That's all that was, and and uh, it, I think it, it it served its purpose. It served its purpose. I found the flow of how I like to talk whenever I'm doing shows and things like that, and and uh, you know I, I got more and more comfortable with my presentation, which helped, and then. You know, I was driving all over the place doing games. So I would do play-by-play at Anderson. And then I would go up and I would do color at Furman. I would do color at USC Upstate, both men's and women's. And then I would do as many radio games as Clemson would have me on. And then I would uh, – I already said Anderson, right? Did I say yep. Anderson? Yeah, yeah I did. said Anderson. So, so I, I just – I ended up getting about 45 games last year, believe it or not. Even wow. in a COVID year, 45 games at location, which – I think beat um, a lot of people because I, I I I knew that nobody was going to hire last year given the circumstances. So I lo- used last year as a chance to gain and gather as much information as possible and get as much experience as possible so I could put together film. So whenever I get a chance to talk to people, then I can get honest, good feedback. And what's happened over the course of this summer is I talked to Matthew Park, that's the Dean of Communications up at Syracuse. He, he got on a Zoom call with me for about 
two hours, went through film. And then uh, I actually became friends with a guy named Bob Rathbun, who I'm sure you yeah. know. He's always at the Atlanta Hawks, and he does all kinds of stuff. And he's kind of uh, he offers this mentorship program for up and coming uh, broadcast people. So I've joined in on that, and he has been terrific for me. Uh, just kind of learning how to manage the truck during the games, and and uh, how I could help the production. He said, you know. And you've said this before to me, Larry, like my knowledge of basketball is 0.01%. I think like I'm, especially when it comes to people that are doing broadcast stuff. He is, he, he, he told me when he first met me, he's like, he, he, he said, your knowledge is, you're good at communicating it, making it simple enough for people to understand. He said, but when you start doing TV, you need to stop thinking basketball and start thinking more about TV. Mm-hmm. Because the, the knowledge for you is just going to come second nature. What you need to focus on is the value you can produce with your to the viewer, as opposed to showing how smart you are. Which to me, like I was, that wasn't my goal. I was just wanting to talk about it because I was enjoying it, and it, it it clear it you know clarified a lot of things for me. And it's and over the summer, like it ended up being really really good. And then I took a Took a gig with the Upward Star Southeast crew, which is an Adidas team, Adidas sponsored team, probably the best uh, AAU team in the state of South Carolina. And we had a young man named Julian Phillips who just committed to LSU, and we've had uh, seven kids sign Division One scholarships, and uh, I helped them all summer. And then um, went back and did, you know, previews for, uh, you know, kind of like what I was doing last year, but it was basically one-page synopsis of every team in the Pac-12, every team in the SEC, every team in the ACC. Because I knew I was going to be doing this stuff with Goodman and Hummel. I agreed to that back in June. And then I was like, well, I better get up to date on some of these other conferences because uh, we're going to be talking about all these guys. I can't get lost. Uh, So uh, it turned out really well. I had to cut it down to five teams for the Big Ten and five teams for the Big 12 because it came a little too too time-consuming the closer we get to season but uh it really helped me with the southeastern conference because that conference is so stinking good and and being able to get all the names and the coaches watching that film and understand how they like to play and what kind of player they like to they like to recruit uh this summer helped tremendously because i was able to do all that and i was able to put out a product for people to be able to watch and read and you know it's starting to gain some steam and it's uh it's worked out really well so when you go and and are and are studying up on on teams you don't know about, are you just pulling up YouTube to watch the, uh, get games from last year? Are you doing or or something more sort of, I guess, more compl- I guess actual film? Like what? How, how do you do it? So what I'll do is because there was so much movement, um, Jeff Borzello, who's become who became a friend over the course of the summer, the writer at ESPN. Uh, he put out uh, the comings and goings of college basketball. So for every team, I would go and get every guy that's currently on on the roster, and then I would go back and see, you know, some teams, I'm telling you, like Georgia had 10 transfers. <laughs> yeah, and, nice. like, it was very difficult. So I would go and I would watch a little bit of how Georgia played, probably – half a game, and then you can kind of understand the ebbs and flows, how the coach calls plays, how much he lets them go, how much he micromanages. You can get that after about a half if you're really watching. And then I had to go and I would watch, I would pull up, I have a Synergy account. So I would go and pull up each player, their last 100 makes. I would see how they scored, how big they were, how fluid they were in their athleticism, because I think that's, that's an important transition whenever guys are going from the mid to the high. Like, you have to see how they move, because sometimes some of these guys rumble, bumble, and stumble their way to 15 and 10, and they end up transferring high major, and they really struggle because they're just, they're everywhere. And it's, it, it, but some of these guys will really, uh, really thrive. And, and, you know, it gets tough sometimes, too, because, you know, Georgia took a, took a JUCO transfer who's really, really good. His name's Dal- Dallin Rig- Riginal. 
And I had to go, I had to do a really deep dive on him, but you do all the percentages, you, you do all that stuff, you write down, I go to their pages, I see their old school pages, what they like, what the coach says about him, things of that nature to kind of get a grip on each player. And then after I get a grip on their players, then the relationship between how this guy plays and how this guy coaches comes into it. So like... There's a lot of that stuff in there too. What is Synergy? Is that like a cut up, like a uh, premium site yeah, so that has Synergy, cut up? Synergy. I have yeah. So I have access to every single game played at every single level of college. Oh basketball. wow! And then um, yeah, so I, I have that access, and then uh, I can also bring up individual players and all their makes, where they make, how they make shots, what direction they like to go whenever they score, uh, what direction they struggle at. Uh, so it's actually kind of funny because when I got that, that synergy stuff, uh, they have it all the way back till 2005. So I showed all my my kids, all my makes, cause that's what I did. <laughs> but, <laughs> that far back. Wow. Yeah. It goes that far back, but I, I have all of them. I have all of them. And it's, um, you know, it takes about six hours per team. For if I'm like really getting after it, and sometimes it extends longer than that because I'm taking phone calls, wow. and we'll have a commitment here and, and things there. So, um, you know, I, I was actually doing really well about a month ago of doing one a day, even on the weekends. And then it got to a point to where, like, with all the shows, and, you know, I did two Duke podcasts the other week. I did a Florida State one. I talked to Dane Bradshaw about Tennessee. Like, I'm going all the way. like it's just so much, and it's it's made it very difficult for me to knock out everything at once and still be able to uh, go to sleep at night. So I, I ended up having to do only the top five, of the Big Ten, and the Big Twelve. But I was able to get the other, you know, thirty eight, thirty nine odd teams from the other three power conferences. Want to share a quick word about Founders Federal Credit Union? If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to foundersfcu.com. So Solero Communications, formerly known as Tandem Payment, is a full-service integrated electronic payments provider powered by leading-edge technology. Solero provides a wide array of merchant solutions, simplified payments. They make onboarding, taking payments, maintaining risk management and compliance, and getting support quick and easy. At Solero, they're all about helping you achieve sustainable growth as a business. Taking payments isn't the only thing your business needs. With Solero's solutions, you can manage inventory, sell products and services via social media, schedule staff, track sales, get reports, and much, much more. Find out more about Solero at solerocommerce.com. That's C-E-L-E-R-O commerce.com. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parm Smith and Archenthold. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing and gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864-326-3507. When you're ready for a complete renovation in your home or business, open the door to more with Harris Home and Harris Commercial. Their local experience team will totally transform any room space from beautiful floor coverings to construction to finished details. Harris handles every step of your renovation process, whether it's a kitchen or living room or an industrial or education educational setting, like some of the positively stunning work they've done at Clemson University. Go to discoverharris.com and experience a total renovation transformation from Harris Home and Harris Commercial. And you mentioned Rathbun saying, hey, you need, you know, yeah, you got all this knowledge, but you need to convert it into TV and sort of what's appealing in that medium. What, what, what does that sound like and look like? Can you give me an example of how you would now modify something from uh, something from the more schematic and analytical to something more TV-ish, because I'm sort of of the opinion that that the analytical stuff works. Like that, that that there are tons of people out there who who want that stuff. So what is what was he talking about, and how was Just that timing. useful to you? Timing, r- timing, rhythm, when to get out, 
when to come back in with my information, when to get out with information. Sometimes I tend to ramble and it's great for like a podcast medium like we're doing now to where like I can get rolling and just talk forever. And, you know, obviously when you do that, it's fine. You can just go. And then whenever you do a TV show, it needs to be a little bit quicker because we're going to treat it like that all American show that we did with Field of 68 after dark. We're going to treat that as if, um, and we'll get to that later. We haven't even talked about it on air, but, but, like I, I needed to treat that more like a TV show. So I'm keeping it a minute and a half, two minutes. And then in the game, I need to be able to punctuate a sentence because something crazy might happen right away. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to get in the way because I'm talking too much. I can't get in the way of my play by play guy because I'm talking too much. So instead of like a 30 second take, it's more like seven to 10 seconds. I need a bunch of cupcakes as opposed to a massive birthday cake. <laughs> so like, so like I need to be able to get in and out in 10, 15 seconds until there's a foul call, until there's an out of bounds, until they zoom in on a certain player. Those are my opportunities to share knowledge as opposed to, you know, and ESPN's going to this stuff now. Like if you look at, if you look at, uh, what's his name? Corey Alexander, like that dude just goes on rants and then talks about stuff that's not even related to the <laughs> yes. game for like a long time. Oh man. And, and I don't, I don't like that style of television. My, my, like, I, I want to appreciate what's on the screen. And what's important to me going forward is, like, I want to match what I'm talking about to what's on the screen, and I need to, I need to be a better presenter. And in order for me to be, to be a better presenter, my timing needs to be better. So... I want it to be enjoyable for the people. I don't want to overwhelm people, like I said, but I also want to make sure that what's on the screen is what's being talked about because, you know, especially, Larry, like when you're doing some of these smaller games, like it's families that are watching. Mm-hmm. Like they're interested in their kid. It's, And I think people need to realize, like if they're doing games as a color commentator, you need to be humble enough to realize that it's not about you. It's about the kids. It's about the people playing. It's about the coach. It's not about, you know, a story that I'm going to give you about me. Like, you can push that in there, but, like, and it can be quick, but you can't go two minutes, you know, TV timeout to TV timeout talking about yourself because there's other kids on there that have put in so much effort to get to that level that it's important that I'm able to do them justice by having timing correctly and being able to emphasize good plays and bad plays. You can always tell the the color analysts that are just winging it, yes. and haven't done their homework. And I think that's sad. I, I think it's, I think it's too bad. You know, the only one that gets away with it with flying colors, in my opinion, is Bill Walton, mm-hmm. just because he's such an eccentric personality that he still makes it fun to watch. But like, to me, I. I, I would just it's it's disrespectful to the coaches and the players' processes if I don't come in with the same amount of uh, preparation as they did. It's not it's not fair to them. All right, fast forwarding to the present. What irons in the fire do you have? And let's, I really want to talk about the one that you we have been sort of alluding to with Jeff Goodman and Doster and others. Uh, explain that for the folks who who have not yet uh, learned about it. Sure. So the, the field of 68 after dark is going to be on six nights a week after the nine o'clock game. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the goal of the show is we don't want to be a, a group of guys sitting and talking about guys over there or players and coaches over there. We want to bring guys to us and bring them in the conversation. And there's a gap in coverage when the coaches leave the gym and are heading back to the airport. Like if we can get those coaches on FaceTime while we're doing that, like while we're doing those things and get coverage that's different, I think it's going to be appreciated by the fan base because it's going to be a little bit less. Uh, I guess the the right word is it's going to be a little grittier. Yeah. We're gonna we're like if somebody says something and we're gonna say it's because it's true. We're not going to sugarcoat it. And it's uh, and you know the, some of these guys have a mouth on them. I, I try not to curse, but uh, you know it's. It's going to be it's going to be unprecedented access compared to anything else, and there's not there's not really anything like it because on ESPN after the game is over they'll give you five minutes about the game, and then they're moving on to the rest of the day's highlights or whatever social thing that they're talking about that day. Like we're going to talk strictly basketball as soon as it's over. We're going to talk about what happened during the game and 
the day's events in basketball. And I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a fun product because we have some good personalities on there. I mean, um, you know, our guest list is ridiculous. Archie Miller's coming on here in a couple of days. I just did the ACC preview with Randolph Childress, uh, Dane Bradshaw, former Tennessee Ball. He was on there. We got Ira Schofel on there. Leonard Hamilton. Every one of the top fifty, the Goodman top fifty uh, teams. Every head coach came on and spoke with us. Wow. Uh, during their preview for our uh, opening episode that ended up getting a little over 60,000 views. We had an all American team of Hunter Dickinson, uh, Andre Corbello, James Akinjo at Baylor, uh, Drew Timmy and Paolo Bancaro. All five came on our show during the show, or we had pre-recorded it during the show. So, the access, and I'm not naive to this, the access that Jeff Goodman has to be able to get these guys is unprecedented. And our presentation style, because we have Robbie Hummel, who is probably the best, I'm just going to say it, Indiana smartass for television and history, <laughs> Purdue legend. Like, that's what he is. The vibe between him and Goodman is great because they just riff on each other and a riff and riff and riff. And then, you know, Dowster played at Vassar College, but he's a huge basketball nerd, so he throws his nerdy stats in there. And then I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the, I'm not going to say the settle down guy, but I'm just kind of in there talking about this and that. And and it's it's a good vibe. It, it, we all really like each other. We like the content. We don't agree on hardly anything, but uh, it's it, it's it's good content. And you know, I it's it's become better and better with each team that we've done and each look at look ahead. And I, I think it's something that, um, that is a lot of that, that's, that's needed right now, because I, I think people want to want to escape real life a little bit and then just watch sports. 60,000. I'm sorry. Go ahead. My bad. Yeah. 60,000 people. Yeah. I think people want to escape and just watch sports and we're going to provide that. I was going to say 60,000 views on a, on a first podcast is amazing. Um, yeah, not bad. Were not you guys bad. like? I mean, they announced it. What's that? Yeah, when they announced it, I mean, the, the Steve Prom, Archie Miller, Randolph Childress, uh, Adam Morrison's going to come on there when we talk Gonzaga. Uh, Bill Self will be on there. It, Steve Prom is going to come on quite a bit. Like our list of guys that we're going to continue to bring in is it's a uh, it's truly unique. It's truly unique. How did this idea come about? You know, they, um, the, the, the field of 68 started a year ago, which is amazing to me because it's almost got already, you know, 65,000 people following them. And it was uh, Rob Doster and Jeff Goodman. And Goodman was kind of looking to expand this because Goodman's with Stadium now. And, and he put out a tweet in like April. He was like, hey, who are the next up and coming uh, people that I should be following for basketball? And, uh, I kind of snuck around this when you'll laugh about this because I knew it. I didn't want to like be like, Hey, I'm doing it. Hey man, look at me. I'm awesome. I didn't want to do any of that. <laughs> so I text my friend, David Bentley, basketball Bentley, who, um, I said, Hey man, look at this. I need you to respond to it and be like, Hey, Terrence is doing this. And Billy's like, yeah, man, of course I'll do it. So he gets on it. He sends out the tweet. I get a phone call from Jeff within five minutes. Hey man, what are you doing? I just kind of told him everything that I had done over the previous year, like we talked about earlier. And it's a, you know, Larry, it's a pretty lengthy list. And then he said, well, let's set up a zoom. I want to get you on with Doster and let's see if we can't figure something out. So we set it up and it was so funny, Larry, like I prepared for this meeting, like he was going to quiz me, like it was some kind of ACT test or something. And within the first five minutes of the call, I realized like, they're recruiting me to be a part of this show. Mm. This isn't like a, this isn't a test of my knowledge or anything like that. They're recruiting me. I, and I told them that and they started laughing. I was like, no, I think we think you'll be really good. I was like, well, I, I ranked all the power six <laughs> 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 getting ready for this. And they're like, well, good. We, we helped you get going a little bit. I was like, yeah, no, no uh, kidding. But they offered me the job on the spot. They said, we think it'll be great between us two and Hummel and you. That's going to be the four. That's going to be the four mainstays. And it'll be every night, and um, that'll be fun. And then I do a once-weekly thing with uh, John Fanta, who's the voice of the Big East, and Doster, and that's just a, 
basically basketball nerding out. It goes for about an hour and some change every Tuesday. Then we put that out at night, and it's it's under the Field of 68 umbrella. But the main show is the After Dark. That's going to start here pretty shortly. And then is the is the revenue is it from advertising just from from the from all the views is that pretty much the model or is there like a, a premium a subscription based option as well or no it's it's basically more views more subscriptions the better we don't charge for you to watch we 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 get paid on advertising so they mm-hmm. just struck up a big deal with um, Bet Rivers out of Chicago mm-hmm. and uh, they're taking care of mostly all of it and they actually bet rivers said hey if you guys can get football going let's get football going too and they actually had eric McLean and uh, ej manuel ready to go for the year and then last second they said hey i don't have enough time so in the acc they're doing field of 12 and it's uh harry douglas who works on espn used to play for the falcons and then I actually got them Cody Sensabaugh, who played at Clemson defensive back, and it was kind of a good dynamic because they were on the same team at, for the Titans, and there was a lot of back and forth, and it's created a good show for those guys too. So Bet Rivers, whenever they decided they asked to go football, whenever they got that done, they signed a, a, a two-year deal, I think. So it's something that's it's got staying power. So the football version is, is on Saturday nights? Is it kind of similar to – is it after games? No, so – no, well, they have a they have a field of twelve after dark, and they'll average about forty thousand people or something like that. I can't remember who all's on there. It's like Bryce Allen who played at Baylor, and and uh, Christian Hackenberg's on there. They got some pretty big names on there too. But look, I mean, the bread and butter is basketball. I mean, we 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 got some good names, and they they got the balls on there last after dark, which I thought was funny. But it's just um, the the bread and butter. We realize it's basketball. And we're going to be able to move forward with all that stuff, but, but uh, like I said, the um, like the after dark thing, I think it's going to be pretty good. The the i the idea of sort of leveraging Goodman's relationships with these coaches and combining that with doing something nobody else has thought of, meaning, hey. These coaches are on their way back. They're on a bus, uh, I guess, the, in road games, on a bus on their way back to the airport or on their, on their way back yeah. to the other to, to their t- uh, town on a couple hour dry, ride. Yeah, let's freaking get them on Facetime. Like when that, they're that in is, a great mood. That's tremendous. When they're in a great mood. And then once you get them, once you get them in a great mood, if you want to talk to one of the players, say, hey man, pass your phone back there. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, so it's. I, I think it's going to be a good product. It's already a good product. Uh, if if anybody watched the All American opening, I mean, it's good. I mean, we we it's it, there's an excellent job of you know we, we they decided to hire on some producers and you know to where we have our own boxes and all that stuff. I mean, it's the the product for an internet based show. Uh, I would venture to say it's unrivaled because of how we talk about it how we make it understandable, how we make it relatable. Uh, it's, I, I honestly, and I say this without hesitation, Larry, it's going to be a top two or three show college basketball show without a doubt. That's any outstanding. Medium, any medium. Um, can I get, we, we have talked all this long and I've yet to get uh, your thoughts on this Clemson basketball team? What's your? What's, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I ramble. No, That's no. What I'm I ramble. I'm sorry. About Rambling that. is 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 great. I love it. Uh, I just I'm curious. What would I, I want to say when we had you on? It was late last season. Just curious. What was your feeling at the end? How, how the season ended, and then going into this year, um, what do you have a feel for how how what this team is going to look like? and what its capabilities are going to be in terms of sort of a, you know, and the ACC and all that. Well, I picked 11th. Uh, Say that again? Year, you broke up there for a second. I have not picked 11th. Gotcha. Um, last year I had them picked 6th, and I think they finished 6th, mm-hmm. right? Was that right? Um, you know, I, so I'm not saying that'll happen this year, but I, I, I just feel like this is a really small team. And, you know, they brought in Niles Bohannon, who's, you know, six five, six six ish, and you know it. It was a team that needed size with Amir leaving. Now Clemson's been small for a long time, but so that's nothing new. But they're going to have to speed up their way of play. 
because Alamir Dawes and Nick Honor, they struggle in the half court because they're so small and they have a hard time shooting over the top. If you notice last year, whenever you watch games, like Alamir Dawes is really good when the game's moving and he can find spots and transition. And then Nick Honor, because he's smaller, he, he even had a hard time shooting over hedges or soft hedges because he's only 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, but when that game opened up is when you saw most of his big games. If you remember his game winner against Georgia Tech last year where he shot it from NBA range and knocked it down, that, that game was moving up and down, and he was being pressured to where he could create space. Space is at such a premium for Clemson because they shoot so many threes, and the fact that they're good three-point shooters – are only successful, not only, but mostly successful whenever the game's moving faster is going to be interesting because Brad has perennially, perennially been one of the slower teams in the conference. Last year it was only, it was second only to Virginia and slowest pace in the conference. So there's going to be an, there's going to be a faster team this year than I think Clemson fans are accustomed to uh, out of necessity because I think it's going to be hard to score. Uh, another key is PJ Hall has to be really good. If P.J. Hall's really good, really fast, Clemson has a chance to compete every night. If he's not, and if he's a year away, there's going to be some games where they struggle because they run so much action through their five-man because that's what they did through Amir last year that he's going to be relied on to make a lot of decisions in the half court when the game slows down because he's the lone big body. So that'll be interesting enough. You know, Hunter is good, but he's he is he your best player on an NCAA team? Uh, I, I would venture to guess no, but he has gotten tremendously better throughout his time. It's just, uh, you know, it's a small team. It's a team that uh, needs to play faster for a coach that hasn't really played fast. It's it's a weird mix of guys. I hope they play faster because I think it'll be a fun brand of basketball to watch. But I think, you know, it's going to be difficult because they weren't able to keep any of their super seniors like some of the other schools in conference were. Well, if if playing faster is not really in your coach's DNA, even if you do play fast, sort of by design, is it is it still is it if it's not natural, sort of a natural part of the the way you coach, is that an issue? Is that a, a, a reason well, for concern? What, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, that's one of my reasons for concern because it's not necessarily something he's super comfortable with. And guys always revert back to what they're comfortable with, especially in January when the games get harder. Mm-hmm. Like, I get, what I could see happening, and this is not a slide, this is just what I could see happening. I, I could see them playing faster uh, for November and half of December, and then they come back from break, and then he's like, gosh, I just feel like I can manufacture shots for these guys at a better rate. And then it kind of slows down a little bit. That That's what would that, – I think that's a cause for concern. But, look, I mean, I think one thing that Brad has, has done throughout his career at Clemson is he has gotten the absolute most out of his talent that he's been able to put on the floor. So to say that he he wouldn't be able to manufacture shots would be wrong. I just wonder – if they're going to be able to maintain a fast style of play throughout the entire year, considering, like you said, it's not something he's typically done or is probably not comfortable with. Chase Hunter, I mean, when he when they signed him, they thought he was a like a legit talent. You know, I still think he is. Uh, has it been injuries of just? The series of injuries he has suffered is just, it's been impossible for him to realize his potential, or maybe some, just, it maybe partly also he just isn't maybe the talent they thought he was, or what, 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 what do you make of, of, of him right now? I think it's been a series of, of unfortunate circumstance. I think, you know, he got, he broke his foot his freshman year after he started his first collegiate game. I think people forget that. Yeah. He started his first collegiate game, breaks his foot sets out the majority of his freshman year last year coming into the years having a great preseason gets a concussion or something i can't remember exactly what it was maybe it was a finger a hand i can't remember what it was i think it was both uh yeah i got a concussion and then broke his hand or something like that so he missed his entire preseason so he's making his way back in a covid year where you didn't even start the season until the end of november and then you have all these pauses right when he starts to play well again they have a two week COVID pause and it's like it's a mess. It's it's been a series of unfortunate circumstances. I still think that Chase Hunter is a really good player. He's a, a, a top level athlete. He's got an he's got a 
like if he played, his brother played football at Georgia. If he wanted to play football, he could because he could put on 25 pounds, no problem. I mean, he's t- that type of body and that type of athlete. And it's just, he hasn't been able to get it out of his own way as far as injury is concerned. And I don't think COVID did anybody any favors anywhere. And for him to never really gather his rhythm since he's gotten on campus, I think this year could be a year to where if he's able to stay healthy and I've heard that he has done a good job of taking care of his body. If he's able to stay healthy, uh, you'll be able to see more flashes of what a lot of people expected of him coming out of high school. Because whenever he came out of high school, Larry, you know this, like it was Michigan State, Virginia, uh, Georgia. Like it was all these like high level recruiting schools that he got uh, offered from, and then Clemson beat them out. So. It's just a matter of you know him finally putting it together and him getting some consistency uh, and able to, and being able to practice even. What uh, what do you think Brownell and this the staff and team have to do to sort of to sort of win? I guess the 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 fan base or the significant portion of the fan base that's sort of uh, on the fence right now, sort of just not sure what to make of of of, of them. Uh, after after the way last year ended? You know, it's sad. Last year was sad for a number of reasons, but it was really sad because they got the, the fans didn't get to see a really good basketball team that he put together. Uh, and so you kind of skipped over when your team was going to be best. So, you know, ultimately, Clemson's not a place that's going to get all these McDonald's kids and just keep recycling through. It's a place that you need to develop for a year. You need to be good for a year. You need to be 500 for a year. Good for a year, 500 for a year. Because it, it's just not a basketball place. And I, I don't think it's anybody, any Clemson fan's fault. I don't think it's the coach's fault. But I think it's difficult for some people from Greenville to get down to Clemson's campus on a Tuesday for a 9 p.m. game. And Clemson's not a huge place. So it's like it makes it difficult for a lot of reasons to be successful to be successful at Clemson on a consistent basis. Now, people have done it, but you also have to understand that when Brad's teams have been best, they've been senior late, and that's not the case this year. So it's 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 going to be hard. for for, And I think because he's been here for so long, a lot of people have already made up their minds. And how quickly do people forget in college athletics? I mean, look at uh, Coach Orgeron down at LSU. He won a freaking national championship two years ago and they're ready to fire him. So, I mean, it's we're, we're in a society of the impatient, and I think that that hurts things sometimes. But, you know, they're going to have to make – I think next year – this year is going to be hard because they're going to rely so much on P.J. Once P.J. figures it out, I think it could be a really good year. But I think it's, it's going to take maybe halfway through this season for him to really get comfortable. Yeah, you that said was that, a hard question, Larry. Yeah. That was a hard question, man. Like I, you know, it, it's he's been here for so long. Yeah, and and I think people have already made up their minds, and people aren't changing their minds. I think there's one thing we've learned over the last two years is that people don't change their minds. So it, it, it is what it is. It's no longer up for interpretation. Clemson fans know what Brownell is, and Brownell knows what he can get out of Clemson. And he's gotten Clemson to a Sweet Sixteen. He's gotten them to the tournament last year. They, they were a sixth seat despite being picked at media day in the teens. Last it's, it's, he's perennially overachieved for his talent. And then, you know, the argument would be, well, he needs to get better talent and retain them. Well, I mean, nobody's getting talent and retaining them anymore. So it's just a matter of setting circum- setting your goals on a year-to-year basis on whether or not Clemson fans are going to be happy. Terrence Oglesby, anything else, man? I, that I, was I, a lot. That was a lot, man. I didn't mean to. I, that, that was that was. You, you, you're throwing some some curveballs at me. Throwing some curveballs at me. No, I, I, no, I think we're good. I think uh, you know this field of 68 stuff. I think it's really exciting. I think a lot of people are going to really enjoy that. It's a tremendous concept. I've told you that on and off the air. And, I, I, I mean, I, you mentioned early in the podcast that, or you alluded to it that there were some uh, possible opportunities with the ACC network that didn't pan out. But I think this is 
this is very much in your wheelhouse, and it, it seems like it provides a more authentic. A, uh, it provides a, a, a way for you to be more authentically you in, in terms of, or as opposed to doing more frills, I guess you could say. And 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 yeah, we're we're, we're not going to major in the cute stuff. Yeah. we're going to major in who and and uh, you know I. To be honest, we talked about this all fair, Larry. Like, I don't care what these kids listen to when they're coming into the games. I don't care about their playlist. I want to. I want to see how they guard somebody. I want to see how they, <laughs> how the coaches find a way to get these guys to score. Like, I want to see that stuff. I don't care what their pregame meal is. I could care less. So, I was bummed at some of the at some of the opportunities that fell through. But then once I started to think about it, I was like, it might have been a blessing in disguise because then I wouldn't have been able to do what I was really good at. And that's talk who. And I think I think uh, I think it's all going to work out, my friend. I, I, your trajectory, I, I maintain, is 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 headed is pointed sharply up, and it's only a matter of time, I think, uh, before you're you're one of the one of the best out there in terms of being a color analyst for basketball. Uh, and I don't, I'm not just saying that to blow smoke. I've, I've told you that before. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's the truth. So. Well, I appreciate you. I, I did a I did a podcast the other day with your buddy down at Florida State Irish. It was it Chauffel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did a, I did a show with him, and he had some very kind words as well. It, it, it's uh, you know all I can do is prepare and work, and then work as hard as I can and let the chips fall where they may, and hopefully they fall in the right spot. Well, keep it up, man, and keep in touch. Really appreciate your time as always. All right, man. Are we are we done? Are we on air? Are we done? Are we well, off? I'm about to hit stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Dang it, I just realized I forgot to ask him about the gift that we still see of Oliver Fernell shaking his head after Terrence tries to go up for a dunk and misses it. I guess I think it was against Duke. Anyway, maybe next time. In all seriousness, thanks to Terrence for joining us. Thanks to our very loyal sponsors for helping make this possible. And most of all, thanks to every one of you for hitting play. Appreciate it. Everybody have a great weekend. Cheers. 